Thank you very much. It's a very great honor to be here. Today I'd like to address a question that might at first seem in need of no explanation. Why is there a Fisk Icelandic collection in the first place? According to its website, in words that may or may not have been written by Patrick Stevens, the Fisk is one of the three largest collections on Icelandic literature and civilization and unrivaled in its resources for the study of the medieval Nordic world. Whatever we might make of such academic bravado, surely the existence of sibling collections in Reykjavik and Copenhagen requires no explanation or would merely recount histories well known to everyone here. But upstate New York is no Iceland, no Denmark. It's not even a Minnesota or a Wisconsin, homes to waves of Scandinavian immigration that help account for the place of Scandinavian studies at those states' universities. Nor is Ithaca a Manitoba, Iceland's only foreign colony so far. The only Scandinavians that settled the farmlands of upstate New York came from Finland, the so-called Finger Lakes Finns, but they brought salmons, not sagas. We might reflect on the sheer unlikelihood of such a collection ever having come to be, high above Cayuga's waters in Ithaca, New York. Ithaca is famously a place where Greek meets Indian. Had Odysseus washed up on its shore, he would have found himself among the Iroquois, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, and the Mohawk. He would have found more familiar neighbors in Troy, Syracuse, Rome, Romulus, and indeed Ulysses in New York. Towns like Ithaca founded during America's post-revolutionary Greco-Roman revival. None of this made Ithaca the likely home of an Icelandic collection. To rephrase my question, what were the cultural and historical preconditions of this American haven for the far-faring Icelandic Odysseus, uh, who is the subject of today's gathering? One answer would retell a well-known American family saga featuring Willard Fisk, man of letters, professor of North European languages, and Cornell's first librarian and his marriage to Jenny McGraw, a wealthy heiress who promptly died of tuberculosis, leaving Fisk with the fortunes that funded his far-faring book collecting. To understand the cultural moment of the Fisk collection, rather than its genesis, is not to understand accidents of biography or the, intellect the intellectual interests of one man. Instead, I'd like to ask how the idea of Iceland and Icelandic literature fit into the palimpsest of Greco-Roman and Native American New England, and how it fits into what a bumper sticker you might still see around Cornell today describes as the four square miles surrounded by reality. That is Ithaca, New York. I'd like to attempt to answer this question with reference to the 19th century philosophical movement known as New England Transcendentalism. Difficult to define, Transcendentalism refers to a movement of American writers and philosophers bound together by an adherence to an idealistic system of thought based on a belief in the essential unity of all creation, the goodness of humanity, and the superiority of insight over logic. Its founding faith was that at the heart of creation, there is a vast spiritual benevolence that would one day be the direct experience of each and every individual. I'll try to explain the significance of this movement for America's evolving interest in Icelandic literature with reference to its two key thinkers, Ralph Waldo Emerson 
and Henry David Thoreau. <clears throat> Stepping back, it's no secret that Americans have long suffered from Viking envy. <laughs> Eight centuries after the Icelandic discovery of North America, American intellectuals like Willard Fisk returned the favor and discovered Iceland. <laughs> Fantasies of America's Norse heritage go back to the legendary settlement of Norumbega, a name applied to New England on 16th century maps, later imagined as a Native American city of ridges, a kind of um, Indian El Dorado. Reinterpreted in Fisk's day as an 11th century Viking city established by Leivur Eriksson outside Boston, conveniently locating Vinland next to Harvard. <laughs> Boston's elite was keen to recruit Leivo as an honorary white Anglo-Saxon Protestant founder, an anti-Columbus, more suited to their tastes than the Italian explorer who personified the political and social power of Boston's Catholics. More importantly, the strange case of Norumbega whose name was derived from an Algonquin Indian word meaning quiet water, shows the fluidity in the American imagination between Native American and Norse myths of various kinds. One case in point. In 1841, the American poet and educator Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, who first lectured on Northern literatures at Harvard in 1837, inscribed Viking origins onto what was mostly considered a Native American artifact in his poem, The Skeleton in Armor. The poem refers to a skeleton that um, was found with metal, bark, and cloth artifacts dug up in Massachusetts. And this mysterious find led to debate on its origins, Native American or even Phoenician, Carthaginian or Egyptian. Like the Bostonians who traced Lever's journey to Harvard, Longfellow was inspired by the Danish archaeologist called Christian Raum, who a 19-year-old Fisk would later seek out in Copenhagen. In his 1837 book, Antiquitates Americana, Raum proposed a Viking origin for a stone tower in Newport, Rhode Island, a theory made possible by uncertainty about the location of Vinland. Longfellow writes, the idea occurred to me of connecting the skeleton with the tower at Newport, generally known as the old windmill, though now claimed by the Danes as the work of one of their early ancestors. Longfellow argues, in jest or in earnest, for a Norse origin for the skeleton who declares I was a Viking old, my deeds though manifold, no scout in verse has taught thee, no saga taught thee. Take heed that in thy verse thou dost the tale rehearse, else dread a dead man's curse. <laughs> For this I sought thee. Longfellow's transformation of an Indian skeleton into a Viking droiko isn't as big a leap as it might seem. Viking and, New and Indian New England coexisted in the 19th century American imagination. Longfellow elsewhere describes the tales of the Chippewa tribe as an Indian Edda. Others viewed the confluence of Indian and Norse myth not as a poetic analogy, but as a matter of historical influence. The ambiguous status of an artifact, like the skeleton in armor, identified as Norse and Native American, reveals not just two rival interpretations, but also a more obscure branch of 19th century American Icelandophilia, the attempt to derive Native American mythologies from Norse myth. To give one example, in 1884, so the year before Fisk left Ithaca, for Italy, the American folklorist Charles Leland published a book, The Algonquin Legends of New England, or Myths and Folklore of the Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot Tribes, 
Its author notes several parallels to Norse myth, including the creation of the first man from an ash tree, declaring, so it goes through the whole Edda, of which all the main incidents are to be found among the sagas of the Wabanaki Indians. Leland recounts also the merry tales of Lox, the mischief maker, who he derives from the Norse god Loki, who, he claims, appears to have been his true progenitor. He draws several parallels, including Lox's theft of a woman's hair, pursuit by a giant bird, relationship with wolves, animal shape-shifting, transformation into a woman, and capture at a waterfall. He eagerly concludes, I quote, it is very remarkable indeed that the only two religions in the world which possess a devil in whom mischief predominates should give to each the same adventures if both did not come from the same source. It's easy to laugh at such zeal uh, today, uh, such misguided zeal, but what interests us are not ingenious claims about Norse influence on Native American myth, but rather the idea that the Norse inheritance in America wasn't limited to white Anglo-Saxon fantasies of racial descent from Vikings. The Icelandic legacy was seen as something so fundamental to the fabric of the New World that it extended even to that world's aboriginal inhabitants. These so-called Indians, it is imagined, might have brought tales of Loki, Odin, and Thor to Ithaca long before Willard Fisk ever did. Fisk's fascination with Iceland has rightly been placed in the context of Longfellow, William Morris, and the Pre-Raphaelites described by Christine Bragadotter in her definitive 2017 study of Fisk, Islenskar Baikur Erlendus. I'd merely like to supplement this account with a discussion of Fisk's collect collection in light of the Zeitgeist of New England Transcendentalism. Just as the so-called new philology might try to discern the meaning of a text within its manuscript context, the collocation of Fisk's Icelandic collection and his collection of Dante and Petrarch seems not coincidental, but essential to understanding the cultural moment of Cornell's collections. For Longfellow, the first American translator of the Divina Commedia, as for Fisk, whose Icelandic collection journeyed to Ithaca from Dante's Florence, mm -hmm. The Eddas and sagas of Iceland and the poetry of Dante were not the eclectic interests of wide-ranging gentlemanly, gentlemanly intellects, but flip sides of the same cultural coin. This currency first received its full valuation in the US in the writings of Emerson and Thoreau. Emerson was the first American author to pepper his writings with allusions to Norse myth, the way that educated elites had always referred to the literature of Greece and Rome. As with his interest in Hinduism and Buddhism, Emerson was an early adopter of the Norse vogue. As a student, he composed a lurid Gothic tale about a Norse prophetess and her magician son. I will spare you the details. <laughs> in his famous essay on self-reliance, a mature Emerson summons the Norse gods once more, declaring, if we cannot at once rise to the sanctities of obedience and faith, let us at least resist our temptations. Let us enter into the state of war and wake Thor and Woden, courage and constancy in our Saxon breasts. The invocation of Odin by his old English name shows that for Emerson, there was no real difference between Norse and Saxon, British and American, Vikings all. Emerson's works are full 
of conspicuous references to Norse history and myth, from Heimskringla, which he calls the Iliad and Odyssey of English history, from Snorra Edda and the sagas of Vinland. Further examples could easily be found in the works of scholars, including a 2017 Hauskoli Islands MA thesis by Zachary Melton. While Emerson's early interest in the Norse was rooted in the idea of shared racial and geographic heritage, in his later works, to quote one scholar, there is no necessary connection between his subject matter and his Norse references. Some other quote from world literature, Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, Chinese, would have done just as well. That is to say, Emerson treats Icelandic literature as no American before him, as classical, no less than the literatures of Greece and Rome. Part of the intellectual inheritance of humankind, the studia humanitatis, or humanities. Emerson's passion for the Norse, unbound by geography and race, takes on a dimension one might call spiritual, a transformation first completed in the work of his friend and protege, Thoreau. I offer no argument today for the direct influence of Emerson, Thoreau, or anyone else on Willard Fisk. <coughs> Fisk literally followed in the footsteps of Emerson when he bought the Italian villa where Emerson had once stayed. But America's most famous writer is mentioned just once in Fisk's published papers, where he, where he alludes to several reasons why Emerson is more read in Sweden than in Denmark. Unfortunately, he does not tell us why. <laughs> Thoreau is mentioned nowhere in Fisk's publish, uh, published works, although I've learned uh, from Christine that Fisk was influenced by the poetry of both men. What I'd like to describe is how the soil in which Fisk's collection Halko Hermansson and Norse studies in the U.S. took root was made fertile in unsuspected ways by the husbandry of these New England transcendentalists. While Emerson's interest in the Norse had been inspired by notions of Vikings as the ancestors of the English and hence Americans and the Icelandic discovery of America and perhaps even New England before Columbus, Thoreau's was rooted in a sense of spiritual affinity and common humanity. That age will be rich indeed, writes Thoreau, when those relics which we call classics and the still older and more than classic but even less known scriptures of the nations shall have still further accumulated, when the Vatican's shall be filled with Vedas and Zenda Vestas and Bibles, with Homers and Dantes and Shakespeare's, and all the centuries to come shall have successively deposited their trophies in the forum of the world. By such a pile, we might hope to scale heaven at last. When a young Willard Fisk writes that poetry has dwelt in the hearts of every nation, and folded its wings under every sun, he was breathing the same air as Thoreau and might as well have been channeling his spirit. Unlike Fisk, Thoreau never learned Old Norse and only ever read skaldic poetry in Latin translation. But for the author of Walden, the literature of early Iceland belonged to what he calls the sacred scriptures or Bibles of mankind. <clears throat> Thoreau's conspicuous use of the plural, Bibles, was meant as a provocation, <clears throat> suggesting the parody of non-Judeo-Christian traditions, pagan Scandinavian, along with Hindu and Chinese, with the Bible per se. To give an example, a month before he died at 44 of the tuberculosis that also claimed Fisk's wife, Thoreau wrote his last essay, <clears throat> 
discussing wild apples in literature, he notes that the apple tree has been celebrated by the Hebrews, Greeks, Romans, and Scandinavians. Along with Adam and Eve, Thoreau tells the tale of Idun from Snorra Edda, which his audience likely would not have known. Thoreau's choice of a Norse myth to allegorize the history of the American apple tree seems revealing in itself. Even more noteworthy is the invocation of these Scandinavians alongside Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans equating the language of Iceland and its myths with the holy languages of the Bible and the church and the Greek and Roman classics. Not least, a historical progression is implied. For Thoreau, like for Snorri Sturluson six centuries before him, Scandinavia was no cultural backwater, but a main current in the course of human events. Thoreau offers the following rhapsodic world history. He says, the age of the world is great enough for our imaginations. From Adam and Eve, at one leap sheer down to the deluge, and then through the ancient monarchies, through Babylon and Thebes, Brahma and Abraham, to Greece and the Argonauts, whence we might start again with Orpheus and the Trojan War, the pyramids and the Olympic Games, and Homer and Athens for our stages. And, after a breathing space at the building of Rome, continue our journey down through Odin and Christ to America. The idea that Odin uh, had beaten Christ to America by nearly 500 years <laughs> only superficially accounts for Thoreau's fascination. While New Englanders were keen to trace Vinland to their <coughs> backyards, Thoreau was skeptical of accounts, uh, like Raunt's, that placed Viking exploration as far south as Massachusetts. What interests him is not the truth of such claims, but their usefulness for his own playful blend of Dichtung und Wahrheit, right, poetry and truth. Asserting a spiritual affinity between the seafaring Icelanders and the inhabitants of Cape Cod, Thoreau states, I was frequently reminded of the Northmen here. The inhabitants of the Cape are often at once farmers and sea rovers. They are more than Vikings or kings of the bays, for their sway extends over the open sea also. Ultimately, Thoreau transcends Emerson's view of America's racial affinity with the Norse, ironically, by claiming a humorous Viking ancestry for himself. Reporting on a mirage he'd seen off the coast of Cape Cod, he writes, Professor Rauden of Copenhagen thinks that the mirage which I noticed had something to do with the name Fertustrander, or wonder strands, given, as I've said, in the old Icelandic account of Thorfinn's expedition to Vinland in the year 1007, to a part of the coast on which he landed. However, if you should sail all the way from Greenland to Buzzards Bay along the coast of Cape Cod, you would get sight of a good many sandy beaches. But whether Thorfinn saw the mirage here or not, <clears throat> Thor O. Thoreau, <laughs> one of the same family, did. And perchance, he continues, it was because Leif the Lucky had, in a previous voyage, taken Thorir and his people off the rock in the middle of the sea that Thor O. was born to see it. <laughs> Thoreau continues, this was not the only mirage which I saw on the Cape, referring, I think, not only to the mirage that Thorfinn Karlsefni saw or didn't see, but to the mirage of Anglo-Saxon New Englanders' Norse ancestry. Emerson had been fond of this idea, but for Thoreau, it was beside the point. Heimskringla, Snorra Edda, and the Vinland sagas were not the property 
of Iceland alone, but the spiritual property of humankind, Bibles of the world, and scriptures of the nations by which we may hope to scale heaven at last. There was no more reason to study them in Copenhagen or Reykjavik than at Harvard, where Thoreau had heard Longfellow's lectures, or indeed in Ithaca, New York. The blending of universal and particular, cosmopolitan and local, past and present, so characteristic of transcendental thought, meant that for Thoreau, Snorri was no less his neighbor and compatriot than yours. In mid-19th century America, the basis for such a claim was very thin. Few had heard of Snorri or the sagas. Education for a few privileged men was still in the Greek and Roman classics. But this idea made sense to Willard Fiske. And how much more sense it makes today when the number of Icelandic books sold in translation is several times the population of Iceland itself. We might ask ourselves, how many literary Icelands are there, out there, across the seas, harbored in the Ithacas of the world? Back in the real Ithaca, three years after Thoreau's death, a university was established where, its founder said, any person can find instruction in any study. Thoreau had lamented the confinement of study in his day to a handful of distant elite institutions. He asked, shall the world be confined to one Paris or one Oxford forever? Cannot students be boarded here and get a liberal education under the skies of Concord, Concord, Massachusetts? We might imagine a similar cry having led to the founding of this university in 1911. Shall the world be confined to one Copenhagen forever? <laughs> Cannot students be boarded here and get a liberal education under the skies of Reykjavik? In the US, Thoreau's words appear to have had the power of a prophecy or even commandment. Eight years later, Congress established the first land grants for public universities. And in 1865, Ezra Cornell, as if heeding Thoreau's cry, founded the university that bears his name, home to the Fisk Icelandic collection, and home for half a century to Halto Hermansson, Iceland's first literary ambassador to the United States. Six centuries before Halto came to Ithaca, Snorri Sturluson had claimed that Norse myth, whose gods he traces to the fall of Troy, was classical, no less than the literatures of Greece and Rome. Intellectuals of the 19th century, like Emerson and Thoreau, were the first Americans to wholeheartedly agree. Unlike the Brothers Grimm, who claimed Icelandic literature for a Deutsche Mythologie. It was these American transcendentalists, ironically, who first proclaimed it as a Weltliteratur, scriptures to be studied in the Vaticans of the world, be they in Reykjavik, Copenhagen, or in Ithaca, New York, where Greek meets Indian, but also Viking. Unlike the Greeks, Thoreau would have understood something that Halkor Hermansson knew well, that the epic journey from Troy to Ithaca led through Iceland. Thank you. <laughs>